inviting us back, and thank you for giving us this opportunity to talk through some of the critical issues that were raised at the last meeting. Uh, we only have a few minutes, so we're going to try to walk through this fairly quickly, but we have a lot of detail. We've done a lot of work, and we're very anxious to share it with you. These are the issues that we're... Oh, sorry. Who are you? Yeah, tell us who you are. Oh, sure. My name is Andrew Winters. I'm the Director of Capital Projects and Planning for Cornell Tech. So we're going to be talking about barging. We're going to focus on several issues that were asked about open space, zoning, some of the dry labs, and as well as some of the city map changes. So I want to walk through the barging issues. And I think it's very important, first of all, to remind people of what the project is. And then we're going to talk about the delivery types. A construction site is very complicated. We have multiple different kinds of buildings as well as site work. And in order to understand how the barging might work, it's important, I think, for people to understand what the different kinds of materials are that will be delivered at the site. It's also important to remember that there is no one barging solution that will solve all, that will get all of the different materials to the site. Each different kind of material, or several different kinds of materials, require different kinds of barging solutions. We're going to walk through the maritime delivery options and issues. We've identified several options that we think are fairly promising, and then we'll talk about next steps. So again, just to remind you quickly of the proposed project plan, we're looking at the potential for a first phase that's about five acres of site, potentially up to four buildings, and an overall site of roughly 12 acres. The phase one also includes the abatement and demolition of the existing Goldwater Hospital, which is a major piece of the project. So we've looked at the material delivery types, and we're trying to break it down to understand where the truck counts come from and what kinds of materials require which percentages of trucks. So the critical thing, and I'll walk through each one of these quickly, but the big issue here is that site prep, which is really consisting of abatement, demolition, and earth moving, is roughly 30% of the overall project. The rest of the materials, which are more associated with the construction of the buildings, steel, concrete, cladding, MEP equipment, and interiors, um, as well as some of the site work, some of the, the, the final site work, which is the finishing site work, not the rough site work, uh, adds it up to uh, about 100%. So let me just walk through these fairly quickly. So if we think about 30% of the materials are associated with abatement, demolition, and earth moving. And what that really includes is the demolition of the building, prior to that, the abatement of the building, the removal of all those materials, as we've talked about here, we'd like to crush the materials on site as much as possible in order to raise the level of the site uh, out of the floodplain, as well as uh, the moving of materials around the site and bringing on some additional clean fill in order to cover the site. And that's the earth moving. So that's roughly 30% of the truck trips that would be generated under the EIS plan that people saw, which is the baseline plan. Steel structure for the buildings is roughly 1% of the overall deliveries. Concrete structure, which would be for the two tall buildings, the residential building and the executive education center, accounts for roughly 17% of the truck counts, and that's something we're going to dig into as uh, later in this presentation. The cladding of the buildings, which is the exterior materials, covers about 2% of the materials. Mechanical, electrical, and plumbing equipment, which tends to arrive in fairly large uh, bulk form, is about 15% of the deliveries. Interiors, which includes things like partition systems, distribution of MEP, finishes, and, um, and furnishings and equipment is about 25%. And finally, site work, which is, again, the finished site work at the end of the project, which would be planters and pavers and trees, material equipment, uh, material and equipment for the utility services, uh, as well as some of the civil work, like the loop road, solar panels, and some of the geothermal associated with the energy issues. So that's the breakdown of the different kinds of materials that we're looking at. When we try to match that with the various different kinds of barging options that we have, here's what we've done. We've evaluated all the existing methodologies for utilizing maritime transport available in New York Harbor. And really there are five types, and we're going to walk through these as part of the presentation. There's a harbor barge, which is fairly simple. There's a roll-on, roll-off system, which you can drive trucks onto a barge and then trucks off of the barge, which could be located either remotely, that is somewhere further away in the harbor, or somewhere adjacent, and those two have different uses. Uh, we could look at a container system where you would bring materials into a container at a far off port and then deliver them here, or we can look at a truck ferry. 
We've assessed all the categories of materials, as you've seen. We've looked at the work requirements for the project, the nature of the deliveries. We visited all the existing harbor facilities that we could. We looked at barge operations in the harbor. And we've also looked at comparable projects throughout the harbor. We've met with industry leaders, and we've evaluated feasibility, including the logistics, which is a critical issue in construction, permitting, also a critical issue, as well as the impacts, not only on the construction project, but on the island itself. So as I said at the beginning, there is no single method of barging that resolves or accommodates all different types of deliveries. But we thought that of the grand list that we looked at, three of the options warranted additional investigation. And each system has its own requirements. So the ones that we're going to talk about tonight in the kinds of materials is the harbor barge, a system we're calling the remote roll-on, roll-off, and a system we're calling the adjacent roll-on, roll-off. So a harbor barge system, essentially the way it works, this is a crane that sits on a barge. The crane and the barge are rented, they come to the island and they put temporary piles down and they, they moor themselves right outside, right off the seawall, as you can see in this picture. This is a picture of some of the construction that's currently going on at Governor's Island. Uh, the crane has a claw handle on it and what it would do is it would, they would, barges would come up and they would, they would, they, the crane would pick up the material, the loose bulk material from the barges, and put it onto the island if we're delivering materials, or it would take demolition materials off the island in the same way. In terms of a location, again, we're at the very beginning of thinking about this, but the idea is to have this as close to the site as possible. It would be located, we think, in the east channel. And I'll talk about the reasons for that in a little bit. But the way we're looking at it is, here you can, you can see that the crane that's closest, the, the, the barge that's closest to the island would have the crane on it. The one that's away from the island is the one that would be pulled back and forth by tugboats. And the crane would essentially lift material from the barge onto the island or from the island onto the barge. All bulk material, all loose material. So what kinds of materials? Debris removal, gravel, soils, bulk materials. In terms of the on-island logistics, there is minimal on-island infrastructure requirements. As I said, the crane would be rented. It sits on a barge. It sits right off the island. We would require to uh, secure piles of debris that would be located within the fence line so people wouldn't be able to access them. Certainly, there would have to be closure of the east promenade. Sorry, let me just go back to that slide. There would be closure of the east promenade during the time that the operation was actually happening, during the time the crane was, was working. And, and we think likely closure, depending on safety issues and permitting issues, likely closure of the East Promenade during the entire demolition phase. Um, in terms of the off-island logistics, the materials would come to the island from an established harbor facility. And I'll walk you through in a few minutes where some of those are. But they're roughly between one hour and four hours away. And in terms of regulatory issues, uh, we, would be need, we would need to work with the state, uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation, for permitting and oversight of the seawall, because we could be impacting the seawall as well as organic materials. Whenever you take organic materials and swing them over the water, DEC is very interested that those don't go into the water. And finally, REOC, because in, any, in, in this scenario, as you can see, we'd be uh, using REOC land, we'd be moving over REOC land in order to accomplish this. The bottom line is we think there's a potential reduction in overall truck trips from this, this method alone of between 20 and 25% of overall truck trips. And that's really the bulk materials, the site um, the site prep that you saw in the first slide. The second type that we're focusing on and that we're doing more work on, which is a little more complicated, is called the remote roll-on, roll-off. And the way this works is, again, it's a rented barge. It would be moored off of the seawall. This is also in, in uh, Governor's Island, the current construction project. And barges with trucks would come and moor off of this, uh, this facility. The trucks would drive onto this barge, and then they would drive up the ramp onto the island. This is just an example of how it works. You see a, a, a pretty piece of heavy equipment coming off the barge, up a ramp. This is a different site where it's being used a little bit further up the Hudson River where there isn't a seawall. It actually works better where there isn't a seawall. In terms of a location, if you look on, the, uh, on your left-hand side where it says structure deck over water, one of the very complicated factors here is that you want this type of system to be perpendicular to the seawall so that the trucks can drive right up the ramp and right onto the site. Because of the currents in the harbor, and because of the way the seawall area is configured, we can't do that. So in order to accomplish this method, we believe we'd have to build a structured deck over the water. 
which would allow for the barges to be pulled up, as you see over on the left. They would be pulled up at an angle. You really want it to be perpendicular. You can't do that, so we're trying to angle it close to the water. And building a deck over the water is a complication, which we'll talk about. So in terms of the types of materials, most of the materials that can be put on a truck, any material that can be put on a truck, honestly, can be put onto this type of system. You have steel, you have cladding, you have MEP interiors, site work materials. Um, in terms of the on-island logistics, as I mentioned, the perpendicular orientation is preferred. That's not possible here. So we're looking at a structural deck over the water to accommodate not only the currents, but also the truck turns, because the longer the truck, the bigger the platform has to be. Uh, we're looking at a possible reconstruction or shoring of the seawall. This uh, option puts more pressure on the seawall, because you have trucks that are literally moving up and down a ramp that may be bearing on areas close to the seawall. Potentially, again, some removal of trees, because you need to create a wide enough area for these vehicles to get through. Again, we're saying likely closure of East Promenade during the construction phase because this is a real industrial operation with trucks coming on and off the island and you really don't want to expose people to, uh, to, to be able to, to walk there because you would have ramps that are open uh, most of the time. Uh, and finally, we do, we, uh, this would require a restoration of the East Promenade following the construction. In terms of the off-island logistics, so the materials come from similar ports as would for the harbor barge, um, but those ports would have to have a truck ramp. Uh, and again, those facilities are located about one to four hours away. Uh, the throughput of trucks is limited by the barge size and length of trip. As you can imagine, if the harbor is four, about four hours away, it's very hard to get efficiency, so we'd be looking for an option that's much closer. In terms of regulatory issues, I don't want to overstate this, but I certainly don't want to understate this. Uh, State DEC permits all overwater construction, and it is not an easy process. They are looking for alternatives, they're looking for different methods that things can be accomplished. It's an issue they take very seriously throughout the state and in New York Harbor. Uh, and we'd also, we'd have to be working very closely with them, and that's one of the next steps that we will be meeting with them to talk about this project. Uh, as well as we'd have to work with the Army Corps of Engineers, because this would be construction in a navigable waterway. Even though it's a temporary piece of construction, we would need to get their permission in order to make sure that, that this could be permitted. Bottom line, we think that the potential reduction in overall truck trips from this methodology is between 25 and 35 percent. And this is additive to what you saw before. There's no overlap. Regional parts of ports of departure that we've looked at, I'll just go through these quickly. The Red Hook Container Terminal, A, which is a little over an hour away by barge. Um, Sunset Park in Brooklyn, B, about an hour and a half by barge. Ports in Staten Island along the east coast, which are over two hours away. And the Port of Newark, which is approximately four hours away by barge. So this brings us to one of the more complicated bits, which is the adjacent roll-on, roll-off. So if it's a good idea to have a roll-on, roll-off and to have something far away, it's a better idea to have it close by. And it's particularly critical, in fact, it's the only solution if we wanted to do concrete uh, by a barge method. Adjacent roll-on, roll-off would, would, would be very important, critical for time-sensitive materials, concrete in particular, which has to be poured within 90 minutes of leaving the plant. So we did a little bit of math. And we have a problem because no existing facilities uh, are within the necessary travel radius to utilize an adjacent or roll-on, roll-off system. As you can see from the map here, in order to get 90 minutes, we're identifying about 30 minutes over the water in order to be safe about this. So when we look at the harbor and we draw a circle of roughly 30 minutes south of the island, uh, we're not close to any ports that exist. And so in order to make this method work for an adjacent roll-on, roll-off system, we would need to be negotiating or discussing with a private landowner along the waterfront and to create a new facility, a new harbor facility along the waterfront, which is, is a tall challenge. We are looking into it, but I don't want to give people the sense that this is an easy thing to do. There's no existing facility and waterfront property along the uh, East River, as most people know, is, is very valuable. I think the other thing to say about concrete is that the logistics of barging, we believe, even if it's very close, uh, will not provide a sufficient volume of required deliveries at the time they're needed. Concrete pours tend to be fairly large, and you need a large number of trucks to get there on time. So one of the conclusions that we've come to is that if we did a concrete roll-on, roll-off system, which again is a, a very big challenge, even if we were able to put it in place, it would not accommodate all the concrete needs. So we'd be uh, doing that without accomplishing the goal. So our conclusions. To put it briefly, we actually feel, feel very good about this. Uh, a couple of options here. There are some major challenges that I don't want to understate. Again, the facilities are far away, 
and that reduces the throughput capacity, which reduces efficiency of getting materials to the site. Uh, if you can do two trips a day with a barge, that's much better than being able to do one trip a day. Regulatory requirements, again, I don't want to understate how complicated it is to work with the state and federal authorities, but we will start to do that. Tides and currents, as most people here know, the currents along the east and west channels um, of Roosevelt Island are some of the strongest in the whole harbor. And so we're looking at a couple of days during the month where there would be no deliveries possible because as we've understood the, the, the tide charts and, and work with some of the harbor uh, folks who, are, who do this sort of work, when the tides and currents are roughly the same speed as a tugboat, they, they can't work. Uh, and that does happen on occasion. And finally, the non-barge deliveries. This is important. We think there are some materials that no matter what system we put into place, are unlikely to be delivered by barge. And, and let me give you some examples. These include emergency deliveries to a site that would include box trucks uh, or smaller trucks that are coming and going from the site to deliver maybe small tools or generators or other types of materials that are not part of a large bulk delivery. Utility vehicles such as Con Ed and Verizon and other sorts of vehicles that we're, we're not doing the work, we don't control them. We can work with them, we could ask them to do that, but we don't have any control over that and we want to be realistic. Uh, and finally, salt small suppliers local suppliers and specialty items. And small suppliers and local suppliers are important for a project like this, but if they're in Queens, let's say, and you're requiring them to drive two hours or three hours to Staten Island to get on a barge in order to come to Roosevelt Island, you're really limiting, and in fact, you're eliminating the possibility of small suppliers and local suppliers. Uh, and finally, specialty items, which may be coming in small trucks that wouldn't be, it wouldn't be appropriate to put that on a barge. So in terms of our next steps for barging, uh, we are targeting maritime deliveries for materials that require the heaviest or the largest trucks. Again, a lot of this is not just about the quantitative and the numbers, it's about the qualitative. We're trying to make sure that if there are deliveries by truck, it is the box trucks, it is the smaller trucks, it is the local delivery trucks, but that the major, that we take care of a lot of the major deliveries through uh, a barge system. In terms of next steps for the harbor barge, we're looking at meeting with DEC to review the regulations. Uh, we, we need to look at possible other locations on Roosevelt Island where this could happen. Again, there are some impacts to the promenade on Roosevelt Island. Whether that's the right place, where's the right place, is something that we would need to discuss with REOC and, and with the community. We need to develop an operations plan to make sure that works. Uh, and finally, we need to review costs and logistics issues. Uh, with the remote and adjacent roll-on, roll-off, these are more complicated issues. Meeting with DEC and Army Corps to review the regulations and to start engineering something to see what can be possible. Again, assessing possible locations on Roosevelt Island becomes really critical here because now we're talking about building something that would be in place for maybe two to three years. Develop an operations plan and continue discussions with EDC and any private harbor facility owners, uh, as well as, again, reviewing the costs uh, and logistics issues. So, as I said, we have done a lot of work. We actually feel really good about where we are. Um, we've met with a lot of different people and we think these represent good directions to move forward with to continue to assess the, uh, the viability of barges. And at this point, let me turn it over to Melanie Myers to, re to review some of the zoning issues that people raise questions about. Thank you, Andrew. Um, good evening. How is everyone? My name is Melanie Myers. I'm with Reed Frank, Harris Shriver, and Jacobson, and representing uh, Cornell University in the application before you. Um, we've had a number of different meetings, and I wanted to touch on a few of the questions and comments that we've heard um, at this point, and certainly we can take more comments and questions, I guess, at the end. Um, so I wanted to talk about four things that we've heard about. Um, some questions uh, about some of the open space uh, that's being proposed as part of the proposal. Uh, just a bit more discussion and description of the zoning that's being proposed in the floor area that would be permitted as a result of the proposal. Uh, discussion about laboratories and what in fact might be used in the research and development facilities um, on the campus, and talk a little bit about the city map change which relates to the street. So open space. Um, what you see here is the, um, the Cornell site um, that uh, is immediately south of the bridge. I think almost everybody knows um, where the site is located. And as part of the proposal, what we would be doing is changing the current zoning of the site from something called R72 to C45 and create a special district. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, it, uh, later on, but uh, the 
proposed area of the zoning would go from the northern loop road immediately south of the bridge to the southern crossroad and would go east-west from bulkhead line to bulkhead line. Um, what you're looking at is the area that would be covered by the zoning and what you see in the red line that is on the, on that, on the map is the area that is part of Cornell's campus. Cornell would be, um, under the proposal, would be t uh, leasing that property and all of Cornell's control and all of Cornell's development would be within the boundaries of, of, of that red line. The waterfront, the promenade, would continue to be operated, maintained, controlled by REAC, and there's nothing about the zoning proposal that we are suggesting that would in any way change the nature of REAC's control or use of the waterfront and the promenade, and would not in any way change the hours of operation. What the zoning does do with regards to the property and the promenade is think about what would happen after Riyadh's leasehold ends at 2068 or earlier at some later date, what would be the right use of the property. So what the zoning does say for the waterfront areas is that it would continue to be used as it's used today, that it would remain open and that there wouldn't be the opportunity at any point in the future to develop it. Way in the future, again, we're not in any way proposing to change the nature of the use that exists today or how it's being operated. Um, there is a reference in that zoning text to hours of operation, and again, not for anything to happen today, but that what we did was simply take the hours that would be, um, are applicable to waterfront areas generally, and propose that as part of this text. So again, nothing is going to change and nothing would be proposed to change for the waterfront. In the property itself, within the Cornell campus, 20% of the space within the red line would be improved under the zoning as publicly accessible open space and Cornell and the operator of the property would be required to maintain that 20% as publicly accessible open space in perpetuity. So those were sort of the questions we had heard about um, open space and that's, we just wanted to clarify um, the intention. Um, for, there were some questions about sort of how the zoning works and what the floor area is. And the, and the image that you see, many of you have seen before, it's a conceptual rendering, it certainly will change over time, of what the Cornell campus might look like in 2037 when it's fully built out. The image that you see is showing about 2.1 million square feet of development on the site, and it's showing buildings of different sizes, which are a combination of academic space, corporate co-location space, uh, residential space, and an executive conference center. And you see that, that, that as a compilation, you'll see taller buildings and smaller buildings, and that's really what the zoning is all about. Um, so again, what we're proposing to do is take the current R72 zoning and change that to a C45 special district text um, that will um, keep the same amount of floor area as exists today, but allow for some additional uses. Um, this is just some math. Today, under current controls, the lot area of the Cornell site is about 542,000 square feet. Um, under current controls today, there is, has the development potential of 6.5 FAR, and I've talked about FAR before, but it's basically the number, you take the lot area, you multiply it by that number, and it tells you how much development potential exists on a site. So today, under the current zoning, there's about 3.5 million square feet of development potential. Again, Cornell's project is about 2.1. And for residential development, it's about 1.87 square feet, million square feet. Um, we're not proposing to change that maximum amount of development, and we're not proposing to change the amount of residential. So with the proposal, the amount of overall development potential would be the same. The amount of residential potential would be the same. The one thing that would change from a floor area standpoint is that there would also be the ability to have the corporate co-location space and the executive conference center. So we are allowing for commercial use and technology labs as part of the development as well. Okay. Um, 
this, there was a question about, and this is a little bit, this is a bar chart um, that um, maybe, is a helpful maybe is a helpful diagram, was trying to think about how you could look at the zoning and think about how the development fits on this site. And one of the principal goals of the zoning is to make sure that the buildings have a known height um, and that they have, as the buildings get taller, that less and less of the development parcel is being used. So what this is showing is that at the lowest levels, that there's at least 30% of the development parcel would be open space. That's in addition to the waterfront area, which would remain open. That for the lower base heights, that at least 40% of the development parcel um, would be open to the sky. For a mid-level, from like 60 to 180 feet, so about, if you're thinking about it, from about four stories to 12 stories, if you're talking about academic buildings, only 40% of the lot could be um, developed, and in the upper portions up to the maximum heights, only 25% of the development site can be utilized. So uh, the requirements for light and air certainly get higher and higher, or more and more as the uh, development gets, gets larger. Um, and there's a lot of discussion, and sort of moving on to laboratory space. And there's a lot of discussion and trying to understand what these labs are like. And they're like the picture that you see in front of you. It's mostly desks. It's a lot of computers. It's a fair amount of hardware. Um, the the types of academic research, the types of the, the types of things that will happen in these spaces is developing software, it's building a computer, it's hardwired stuff, it's not biological, it's not radioactive, and it's the type of space that, frankly, you find in just about every type of college, um, and uh, that you would see in many of the software companies that you look at today. But we wanted to sort of make, you, make it clear that what we're really looking at is something which looks like a bunch of people uh, working, on a, uh, working on a machine. And I think the one other thing we wanted to mention, I think there have been some questions about um, how the street would be mapped and what it would mean for the street. Um, I think most of you know, many of you have been at the meetings before, one of the proposals is to take the street system that exists on Roosevelt Island and actually formally map the city street south of Main Street so it would go down and it would wrap around the Cornell campus. In doing that, the um, street will also be improved. A bike lane will be added, and there'll be landscaping on the inboard side. Excuse me. And one of the things I just want to be really clear about, in order to sort of set that, um, that the city mapping will again not in any way change or affect the promenade, we would only be improving the street inboard so that the width of the promenade as it exists today would be the width of the promenade as it exists after the um, after the street is improved, there'll be more. There'll be trees and new trees on the inboard side, and there will be, as I said, a uh, bike lane. Um, but we will not be affecting the promenade. And I think that's it. Again, we just wanted to do a very quick overview of some of the comments. Is that it for, uh, for now? Okay. Great. Um, one one second here. Let me grab my list of speakers here. Right. There. Special request made by the school principal for PSIS 217. Is she here? If, if she wants to come up now, you had a time deadline, right? So I'm going to let you go ahead and quickly speak here. Uh, and what we'll do, we'll allow three minutes per speaker. Um, but go ahead, let's uh, let's get started. All right. Well, good evening, Roosevelt residents, as well as Cornell. Um, my name is Mandana Beckman. I'm the principal of PSIS 217. Um, we're a pre-K through eighth grade building on Roosevelt Island, and what I'm here tonight to do is let Cornell know that we did review the chapter four section of the DEIS report, and we noticed that the student enrollment numbers that were indicated were off. You had used data from 2010 to 2011, and um, at the time, it stated that we had 325 students, when actually that data didn't include a pre-K of 36 students. So today in our building, we have 482 students. It's increased primarily because we've introduced a gifted 
and talented program. And right now it goes kindergarten through third grade. So we know every year we're going to be increasing our numbers and we will be reaching the school's capacity. But my concern is the numbers that they were using in the report and if we need updated numbers, the DOE may not be releasing those updated numbers, but you're certainly welcome to get, get that from the school. Um, the other thing in terms of just letting everyone know, we've had conversations with Cornell, but the greatest way that we're looking to create a partnership with Cornell Technion is really to have a partnership with our students, with our teachers, and of course the school community. We know that a successful school is a school that has staff that is very aware of what they're learning and they're up to date with technology, and we want to make sure that Cornell is going to provide the mentorship and the facilities to support the internal structures that we have currently in our building. Uh, we also are looking to have to make sure that we have the most up-to-date technology in our building and that we're able to provide students the experiences to have the STEM experiences through those technology. We also believe that by having this partnership, we'll be creating students that have the opportunity for more college and career readiness, which is aligned with the initiatives of the DOE. Our biggest question is just wondering when we're going to have our next face-to-face -face meeting, which we had in September, and we're looking to have that meeting soon, as well as under getting a better understanding of when we have this face-to-face -face meeting, will something happen in terms of our partnership this school year, or do we really have to wait until 2037 for something to happen? I just want to introduce um, Ursula Fokin, who's our coach. Good evening, everyone. Um, one of the things that surprised us is when we did our own research, Cornell had a great variety of outreach community programs already established. We'd like to take advantage of some of those programs that already exist. Um, we're particularly interested in after-school programs, enrichment programs, honors classes, and the kind of career uh, day opportunities, especially for the girls in our school. Um, we're also interested in partnering in terms of updating our own technology, making a very savvy group of tech-wise students um, who can help teachers and students um, use the technology that is available to them and uh, also to continue to work with Cornell and to try to establish these programs as quickly as we can. Okay, the next, next speaker we have is, uh, the, this is the uh, representatives of the International Masonry Institute, bricklayers and allied craft workers union. We have two of you, right? So that'll be three minutes apiece. Also, this is important. I'll get out of the way of the screen here. If you have comments or questions, it should be sent to that top website above. That's very important. It's on environmental issues, correct. On environmental issues, you need to send any comments or issues to that top website. So you log in that's a sort of an official uh, site where you can go in and log on. So go ahead. Yep. Good morning, Bob. Thank you. I'm the task force following Cornell. My name is William Nagel. I represent the Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers, Local 1 in New York. And we're here today to um, see if we can get your support and the community board support to pass a resolution that would require more rigorous green building standards um, from Cornell, especially uh, with in particular with respect to the use of locally manufactured construction materials and the construction that's going to be going on going on. Um, essentially, the point I was supposed to meet a lease certification on this first building, um, for, for, uh, essentially that means that 20 to 30% of the construction materials that will be used in construction uh, will probably be sourced within 500 mile radius of the site. Um, we think Cornell should adopt a more rigorous standard than that. In fact, we looked and we found the Cornell uh, Tompkins County Extension for Green Construction uh, in Ithaca advocates that 50% of the dollar volume of materials should be manufactured within a 100 mile radius of the site. Now, what does that do? Um, it really doesn't have an impact in particular on the island, but it has an impact on the larger economy here within the New York metropolitan area. Um, we're talking about uh, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, reduction of material transportation time, fuel, fuel consumption, it means to incentivize local entrepreneurs, innovate and target local demand, uh, means to improve community relations, and means to increase local jobs that contribute to local tax base. Um, so we've analyzed this, our, our design professionals can speak with us in a minute, it's analyzed this and we don't believe that this is going to have 
any significant effect on Cornell's decisions about the visual impact of the facility. So it will look where it's going. We think that we can meet this requirement simply by looking at the skeleton of the building and implementing this kind of requirement in the purchasing of the materials to the skeleton of the building. Um, and that's where you can build this in. Um, Cornell promises to make New York City a leader in advanced engineering. At the same time, this kind of commitment from Cornell will build, to build globally manufactured construction materials will help try the other sectors of our local economy and ensure a more sustainable environment and stable community for New Yorkers. Now I'm going to turn the presentation over to um, Mr. John Chensky, and he's the Director of Market Development and Technical Services at the International Masonry Institute. John. Thank you. Good evening. Order. A local developer who was running for public office said that his company constructs a building in New York City, much of the material used for that building is made outside the U.S. Uh, you look at the materials used today in building and where they potentially come from, you have the glass from here, it could be Europe, China, Pittsburgh, another country, China. <laughs> <laughs> Structural steel, steel for stuff, South Korea, Brazil, Mexico, Western Pennsylvania, even drywall from Pennsylvania and South Jersey. Seeing block, several factories within 50 miles, including one right here in Brooklyn, New York. We in New York City have a $25 billion construction industry that provides many construction jobs, and this is great for all of us. It brings a lot of money to everyone and uh, makes successes for a lot of people out there looking for jobs. But this $25 billion that we use is not leveraged properly. We get a lot of buildings built, but locally, we really don't benefit as far as the materials are concerned on these buildings. A good amount of jobs that will be created if we build up the local construction material manufacturing sector, we already have this place to use the ceiling block. If the people here that don't know what ceiling block is, it's still sometimes referred as cinder block. It's really the building back or the skeleton in New York City. At the UN project, old ceiling material was actually crushed down and shipped to a factory and then made into the block and then shipped back to the UN. We had a block plant right here in Brooklyn that can actually uh, be involved with the shipping of that material not too far from the water. And we also have plants within the close proximity of the city. We have sand quarries, local truck, and other trade associations, all tied to one CME block. For every CME block that goes in, it's not only work there putting it in, there's a lot of different jobs that are required to uh, support the work there. Let's take advantage of this resource. Uh, again, what Bill was saying earlier, we don't want to dictate the scheme of the aesthetic vision of Cornell that we architects, but we wanted to look at local materials and really look at using this material more in the construction of the buildings. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks.